Representation matters. But as indigenous Chicano people, we can't just sit back and wait for mainstream media outlets to make it happen for us. And nor should we. We started the Tales from Aztlantis podcast because we believe that it is imperative for Chicanos, Chicanas, and Chicanex people to produce our own media and tell our own stories. And the way we choose to do this is by using Buzzsprout to host the podcast. Buzzsprout is by far the easiest and best way to launch a professional podcast. You'll get a podcast website, audio players that you can drop into other websites, detailed analytics to see how people are listening, tools to promote your episodes, and much more. To start your own podcast and get a $20 Amazon gift card, follow the link in the show notes. This lets Buzzsprout know that we sent you and helps support the show. Buzzsprout, the easiest way to start a podcast. Now, on with the show. You must excuse me. I've grown quite where I... This hasn't been easy, I know. But you've learned a lesson. A lesson in honesty. Honesty to yourself and honesty to others. That lesson will stand you in good stead all your life. I, I think we've all learned a good lesson. I've always heard that honesty is the best policy. Now I'm catching on to why that's so, why that's so, why that's so, why that's so. Why that's Greetings, so. dear listeners, and welcome to Tales from Aztlantis, the podcast where we explore Mesoamerican pseudo history, mythology, and other stories of adventure. I am your host, Curly Tlapoyawa. And I am Ruben Ariano Tlacateca. So we've been saving this topic for a while, and uh, I, I think it's finally time that we started to. Peel back the layers of the many stories and myths regarding La Virgen de Guadalupe. What do you think, man? Would you say these are layers of tilmas? <laughs> That's good. Well, it's what I like to call the immaculate deception. Dun, dun, dun. When Spanish forces under the command of Hernando Cortes, first set foot on the eastern coast of Mexico on April 22, 1519, they christened the site of their landing Veracruz, the True Cross. Within five years of Cortes's arrival, a group of Franciscan missionaries arrived in Mexico tasked with converting the previously unknown indigenous people to Christianity. These missionaries brought with them a worldview forged in the apocalyptic and millenarian ideas that had become characteristic of Spanish Franciscanism. Driving this project of missionization was what J.L. Fallon described as the millennial kingdom of the Franciscans in the New World. In this episode, I'm going to explore the millennialist roots of these early Franciscan missionaries and argue that their apocalyptic beliefs not only influenced the emergent Mexican identity, but directly resulted in what is easily Mexico's most recognizable national symbol, La Virgen de Guadalupe. The Legacy of Joachim of Fior the millennialist worldviews held by Franciscan missionaries to the New World were rooted in the writings of Joachim of Fior, a Cistercian abbot who lived from 1130 to 1202 CE. Fior led a controversial reform of his order and established a monastery in which a vow of poverty was required. Historian Delno West has called Fior the most important apocalyptic writer and exeget of prophecy in the Middle Ages. Fior is best known for developing an outline of world history in which humanity would pass through three ages, ending in an age of the Holy Spirit. Guided by Joachimist thought, Franciscan missionaries sought to create a new Jerusalem in Mexico, in which the age of the Holy Spirit the return to primitive Christianity, the millennial kingdom promised in Revelation and the restitution of Eden all coalesced 
to inspire a new church worthy of its new world. The conduit that introduced Joachimist thinking into Mexico was the ecclesiastical province of San Gabriel in Extremadura, Spain. San Gabriel was the home province of the first 12 Franciscan missionaries sent to Mexico. The province of San Gabriel was established by Fray Juan de Guadalupe in 1518. Fray Guadalupe advocated a return to the strict observance of the vow of poverty, and his ideas were directly inspired by the Joachimist theology and writings of the spiritual Franciscans of the 13th century. As George Bodeau observed, the fact that this newly established province was so deeply influenced by Joachimist thought meant that any events surrounding the discovery of the New World, as well as the subsequent victory of Cortes in 1521, would inevitably be interpreted in this light. In his fourth letter to King Charles V, Cortes petitioned for Franciscan and Dominican friars to spread the gospel in the New World. Charles responded by appointing Fray Martín de Valencia of San Gabriel to lead a group of 12 Franciscans to Mexico, a deliberate reference to Christ's 12 disciples. Among the 12 were Martín de Valencia, Jerónimo de Mendieta, and Toribio de Benavente, the last of whom would eventually take on the Nahuatl name Motolinia. These first 12 missionaries sought to create a monastic spiritual church in the New World based on the Vida Apostolica, a concept that sought to reclaim the primitive church through three principles, poor, simple, and penitential. They viewed their mission as the beginning of the last preaching of the gospel on the eve of the end of the world. So, super positive. <laughs> <laughs> A millennial new world. On May 13, 1524, the 12 missionaries left Spain and headed to Mexico. These men saw themselves as inheriting the legacy of the spiritual Franciscans and were therefore convinced that they were beginning the last great preaching of the gospel before the end of the world, that the new world was in fact the platform for the third age of history, the age of the spirit. This reference to the age of the spirit is a clear indication of how deeply rooted the 12 missionaries were in Joachimist thinking. Their belief that a new Jerusalem was to be established in Mexico was reinforced by the popular myth that the indigenous people of the Americas were descendants of the lost tribes of Israel. One of the most influential of these new spiritual Franciscans was Fray Toribio de Benavente, or Motolinia, as he preferred to be called. Motolinia wrote a book titled La Historia de los Indios de la Nueva España, a collection of three treatises detailing the history of the Indians of New Spain. Given his world view being... God damn it. <laughs> Given that Motolinia's worldview was shaped by Joachimist thought, it is apparent that the book's organization into three separate sections is not without meaning. As Lisa Kaufman has noted, The three-part structure of the Historia de los Indios de la Nueva España can be seen as a rough superimposition of Joaquim's three stages of history onto Mexican reality. The Age of God, or the Old Testament, the time of the Israelites' darkness and wandering, their idolatry, corresponds to the description of Aztec religious practices in Treatise 1, the vision of Mexico as a world of darkness and deception in servitude to the quote-unquote Prince of Darkness. Chihuahua. <laughs> the, <laughs> the Age of Christ, or the New Testament, the salvation of mankind through the coming of a Messiah, i.e. Jesus, corresponds to the descriptions of the Franciscans' establishment of the sacraments of baptism, marriage, and penitence in Treatise 2. Finally, the age of the Spirit, the millennial reign of the saints corresponding to the extolling of the Mexican landscape and the faithful Indian Christians in Treatise 3. 
On June 18, 1539, a group of recently converted Tlaxcalteca natives gathered in the central plaza of Tlaxcala, a vast city-state located to the southeast of Mexico City, to perform a mock battle in celebration of Corpus Christi. This theatrical event, titled The Conquest of Jerusalem, was written by Franciscan missionaries. In it, thousands of Tlaxcalteca warriors engaged in a fierce battle against the great Sultan of Babylon, whose infidel forces were occupying Jerusalem. After several hours, the Tlaxcalteca forces emerged triumphant, and the bloody reconquest of Jerusalem was complete. Motolonia prefaced his description of this event by praying that this prophesied victory would soon happen. Other prominent Franciscan missionaries sent to New Spain included Diego de Landa, Jerónimo de Mendieta, and Bernardino de Sahagún. Diego de Landa was one of the first Franciscans sent to the Yucatán Peninsula and is famous for burning approximately 5,000 Maya ceremonial images and books during an auto de fe, or act of faith, on July 12th, 1562. What a dick. Yeah, what an asshole. Bernardino de Sahagún sought to record Nahua history and Cosmovision in as much detail as possible so that his fellow priests would be better equipped to identify and weed out Mexican idolatry. His results resulted in the 12-volume Florentine Codex, a massive undertaken. Undertaken? God damn it. Undertaker. <laughs> His efforts resulted in the 12-volume Florentine Codex, a massive undertaking written in both Spanish and Nahuatl. Jerónimo de Mendieta was born in 1525 and entered the Franciscan order in Bolbao when he was 20 years old. In 1554, he traveled to Mexico to spread the gospel and learn the Nahuatl language. Once in Mexico, Mendieta lived in the monastery of Tlatelolco and spent most of his time working on the book that would make him famous, the Historia Ecclesiastica Indiana, a chronicle of the early evangelization of the New World. The church initially prohibited the publication of this work, declaring that it contained millenarian yokemist ideas. Well, duh. The Historia was eventually published in 1870, after being rediscovered by the historian Joaquin Garcia y Casbalceta. As previously noted, the millennialist views brought to Mexico by Franciscan friars manifested themselves in a variety of ways, from the production of Nahuatl language plays to the public destruction of works of the devil, quote unquote. However, no millennial concept would have a greater influence on the Mexican people than the Virgin of Guadalupe, the Dark Woman of the Apocalypse. It should come as no surprise that the famous Virgin of Guadalupe of Mexico has its origins in the province of Extremadura, Spain. After all, Extremadura had served as ground zero for apocalyptic yokemist teachings. According to the Guadalupe tradition, it was in Extremadura that a Spaniard named Gil Cordero discovered a small image of the Virgin Mary on the bank of the Guadalupe River sometime in the middle of the 13th century. The Christians of Seville may have buried the small wooden image around the year 714 while fleeing the Moors. The name of the river, Guadalupe, appears to be an Arabic-Latin compound word, meaning river of the wolf. I've also heard it it could mean hidden river, but yeah, there's there's several interpretations of that etymology. Yeah. Cordero built a small hermitage on the site of his discovery in honor of La Virgen de Guadalupe, right? So the little virgin image that he had found on the bank of the Guadalupe River, he called La Virgen de Guadalupe. Makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And then he built like a little church there to, to worship her. The discovery of the carved image was viewed as a sign from God. In 1337, King Alfonso XI visited the hermitage, 
asking the Virgin for assistance in his battle against the Muslims. On October 30th, 1340, the unified Castilian and Portuguese forces led by Alfonso XI defeated the Muslims of North Africa at the Battle of the Salado River. King Alfonso credited this victory to his faith in La Virgen, and he ordered a monastery built on the site of the Hermitage. To help spread the veneration of Our Lady, artists began to paint replications of the carving and earned money for the shrine by selling prints of it. The image's influence quickly grew. Among the devotees to La Virgen was a soldier named Hernán Cortés. Cortés was fanatically devoted to the worship of La Virgen de Guadalupe, and he carried an image of her on his banner. In 1519, Cortés invaded the Valley of Mexico, bringing the image of La Virgen with him to the New World. It was Cortés's banner that served as the quote-unquote official flag of the Spanish until the first Spanish officials began to arrive. It is said that Hernán Cortés was so devoted to the Virgin that he had a special necklace commissioned and sent back to Extremadura as an ex-voto, although not all historians agree uh, with the historical veracity of this claim. What we do know is that Hernán Cortés loved La Virgen de Guadalupe. Other prominent devotees to La Virgen included King Ferdinand II, Queen Isabella I, and none other than Christopher Columbus. It was during a pilgrimage to the monastery of Our Lady of Guadalupe in 1486 that Columbus negotiated the royal sponsorship of his proposed voyage to India. When Columbus returned from his 1492 journey, he visited the shrine to thank the Virgin of Guadalupe for granting him a safe and successful voyage. As a symbol of his gratitude, Columbus named the Caribbean island of Guadalupe in her honor. No, I, I think I think it's pronounced Guadalupe. Yeah, you know what? I've always, I was going to say it that way, but somebody was going to be like, oh, it's no problem. Well, how do they know? I mean, how do we know what Columbus sounded like? <laughs> Maybe because he wasn't Spanish, right? He was a a Genoese uh, navigator. So he named that island Guadalupe or Guadalupe. I've also heard it called Guadalupe. So Guadalupe. It sounds very loopy. (laughs) Eventually, a shrine in honor of Cortez's and Columbus's beloved Virgen de Guadalupe was established in Tepeyac, near Mexico City. And it is there that we will continue this story in part two of this very special episode of Tales from Aslantis. One thing that I love uh, about, you know, doing... Because you know me, I've, I've been doing a deep dive into the, the history of, of La Virgen for quite some time. I've, I've spent a lot of time on it. Well, yeah, I was going to ask you, actually, like, you know, in your original piece, you don't provide all this context back, you know, back then you hadn't done this deep, his, you know, historical research onto the emergence of, you know, the Virgin and, and the framework that she comes out in with the millennialist tradition. So I think this provides very good context for that. Thank you. I, um, yeah, it's one of those things that I keep returning to, you know. Um, the more I learn, the, the, the more I, I get intrigued about just peeling back the layers of this onion of, you know, this image and why people hold this image so sacred. But the one thing that really stands out to me is the fact that Christopher Columbus and Hernán Cortés uh, were like super faithful, fanatical devotees <laughs> of La Virgen de Guadalupe. Coincidence? <laughs> <laughs> and if you look at uh, Cortez's banner, his estandarte that he brought with him, you know, it's that image. She's Do we have there. it? She's, Is it still in got, existence? Yeah, it's, it? uh, it's hanging. I've seen it. Um, it's hanging in uh, Chapultepec Castle. Really? I believe. Okay. I, I think that's where I saw it. But I know that I saw, you know, they have it preserved. They have it behind a, 
And it has the glass. image of the Virgen as it was back in Spain, not the Virgen de Guadalupe from the yes. Americas. So it has this image of her and it's it's from the waist up and she's got her hands in prayer and she has her head down. You know, it's, it's basically the same pose. And then it has, um, I believe, 12 stars, stars yeah. above her head. But yeah, I mean... One of the funny things is when I point out to people like, well, you know, the tradition of La Virgen de Guadalupe comes from Spain. It's not an, a Mexican tradition. tradition it's not yeah. of Mexican origin. It, it kind of, you know, you could see the cognitive dissonance at, at work, like in real time as people <laughs> hear this and they're like, no, How no, can that no, be? that that's not true. Um, when I bring up that the island of, of uh, Guadalupe is named... After, after what, her yeah. and and that Christopher Columbus gave it that name, people are like, "Well, how could that be? You know, she did not exist prior to, you know." To, Do these people not acknowledge that there is a Virgen de Guadalupe in Spain that still exists that predates <laughs> yeah. the one in Mexico? Well, some people do, and what I love about their level of cognitive dissonance is they explain it away as like, "Well, she appeared in two places, right?" In different times, so. to different peoples, <laughs> for two different purposes, for different and was utilized in in completely different ways. Well, she was both. She was, in, I think, in both instances, she was utilized in the same way that that Santiago was used by later um, conquistadores, right? Like Santiago in in Spain, and, and I talk about this in my recent article where Santiago in in in, in the Spanish context he was known as Mata Moros, right? Because mm -hmm. he was he was helping to uh, expel the Moors from the Spanish Peninsula, and so it's kind of like a symbol from the sky, and and she's operating in that same sort of framework of this um, supernatural, um, godly heavenly attribution that is being used to expel one people from a place and in the American context both uh, Santiago and the Virgen are both being used as symbols of conquest and mm -hmm. so in, yeah. in, in, in the American context Santiago becomes from Mata Moros to Mata Indios and that's a little story that people have sort of forgotten but if you do the research you will bear this out that Santiago was a symbol of conquest to a lot of indigenous people. In fact, it's part of the tradición de la danza conchera. The, the origin myth, right, of Santiago comes from this notion of being conquered and uh, trying to uh, reconcile indigenous tradition with the imposition of Catholicism. Yeah, well, it's, it's all part of that, like, larger um, apparitionist tradition, right, where... These, uh, these things appear to a people, chosen people, it's always chosen people, these, because why else would they appear, right? And then they basically inspire you, or, or they put their stamp on it. They co-sign mm -hmm. on your the mission. Sign of it's, it's the literal sign of approval from the heavens that you uh, are the victor in this scenario. Right. Yeah, and that your cause is just. And then, yeah, exactly. It's justified because it's been ordained by... You know, the gods, or in this case, the Virgen or Santiago. Yeah, and, and the other thing that I found interesting, you know, in, in doing all this research was just the fact that, goddamn, these, these uh, Catholic missionaries, they were like the Franciscan missionaries. They were part of like a doomsday cult <laughs> that they brought with <laughs> well, them to the before, New World. <laughs> before, you get, before you get to that part, I wanted to ask you, you're familiar with, with this notion, they're, like there's... Um, there's this recent um, conversation about whether or not the Virgin actually appeared in, was it Tepeyacac or was it a different mound or, are you familiar with that? It's like a recent thing that came out recently, uh, maybe last year or the year before where there's a controversy about where the apparition is supposedly a, like where the actual place of the apparition took place, like was it some people are saying that it wasn't really in Tepeyac because of some kind of discrepancy in, in the narrative. Are you familiar with no, that? No, but now you've given me something to Yeah. Okay. I'm that's that's that. that's another little thread that we need to sort of follow and, and see where that leads. But yeah, apparently there's this 
I'm not sure how big the controversy, or maybe I'm just I'm misremembering what I read. But I could, I could, I could, if if I remember correctly, I, if there's something about the Peyakak and how there's some sort of discrepancy between that place and the apparition. Well, what I love is that you know people arguing over where this purely fictional thing yeah. allegedly took place. <laughs> <laughs> right it's like no you're wrong man she appeared in my backyard no she appeared in my backyard it's like i hate to tell you this but she isn't real <laughs> <laughs> oh curly. But yeah but yeah this whole idea of that you know they were coming here to establish a new jerusalem and that hopefully they were going to bring about the end of the world as the chosen people it's it's pretty freaky stuff, you know, and a lot of this gets left out of discussions about the conquest of Mexico or, that was, you know, quote unquote, conquest of Mexico, the invasion of Mexico. People usually when they talk about the religious aspects, they just talk about, well, they came here and they were converting people and blah, blah, blah. Some people didn't have souls and then they recognize that they had souls, but they don't get into the like the nitty gritty of what these people actually believed and what a lot of their intent was in coming here with this idea that they wanted to bring about, you know, the second coming of Jesus Christ and the destruction of Israel and this new Jerusalem. <laughs> well, I mean, this, I don't know about the dis- destruction of Israel. Was that part of the Well, narrative? I mean, you know, Israel didn't exist, but I, right. you know, I mean, um, like the but this destruction idea. of Jerusalem. Yeah, this idea of the destruction the, of the, the, the temple. Is that what it is? Is yes. that what you're referring to? Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's interesting here where um, Columbus also is part of that same broader conversation about this uh, millenarian cosmology that these um, priests are are bringing to the Americas because uh, anyone who knows a little bit about that history about Columbus and the so-called discovery of the Americas understands that he went to his grave believing that he was that he had reached India, right? He did. He refused, even when it was it was exposed to him. After it was finally argued, you know, that it was an entirely new set of continents in the Western Hemisphere that had never been, you know, previously were unknown to Europe, and and he refused to believe that. And he also believed that somewhere in, in the northern reaches of South America, probably somewhere near where Colombia is today, that he had discovered references to the Garden of Eden and that apparently that's where the terrestrial paradise existed and and that signaled to him in his worldview in his in his um, explanation of this new world right because that's where the the term new world a lot of people think that it refers to well you have an old world and you have a new world sure but it's really the new world is the new world that is to come right that is that is tied mm-hmm. to this millenn- millenarian tradition of the coming of the new age and he believed it as well right he believed that he had discovered the land where the garden of eden existed and that all you needed to do was to just send out some explorers into those far reaches of of south america and that you would get to you know the 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 land that was promised the promised land right by by god and so it kind of ties in neatly with 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 the tradition of of these uh, 12 uh, friars that came to Mexico with these same ideas of we're going to come to this place and we're going. This is going to be the final preaching of the gospel to these people who, in their mind, were the last people on the planet who had not been exposed to the word of God. And they and as soon as these people are converted and they realize that they've been worshiping the devil mm-hmm. and they realize that, that they that there's a one true God that they, and and once they accept Jesus Christ into their hearts so that they will convert. And that will bring about the reign of of Jesus, a 1,000 year reign uh, uh, on, on on Earth, on the terrestrial paradise. So all these all these different threads that seem like they don't really belong together. If you really you know start doing some work and and weaving them together, you you realize that they're all connected. Yeah, yeah, it's like this tapestry exactly of, of bizarre beliefs that all kind of they, they all come from the same place. And it's all these different actors carrying out different parts of these ideas. And then they all sort of coalesce uh, within Mexico with, uh, 
you know, the fall of Tenochtitlan and the introduction of, of all these crazy ideas. Um, one of the other things that I found interesting here in, in this uh, context for the Virgin is um, where you bring up the lost tribes of Israel and the connection that a lot of the early chroniclers and the early Spanish writers and mainly a lot of the friars, some of these same millenarianist people. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, if you keep following those different threads of millenarianism, you know, this idea of these American men, right? The quote unquote, the American man were somehow tied to the quote unquote, the lost tribes of, uh, tribes of Israel. And that according to Felon, you know, you mentioned Felon, and in and, and his article, The Millennial Kingdom of the Franciscans in the New World, which was in an edited volume published in 1970, um, he discusses that the apocalypse in, uh, in the Age of Discovery was a time that was largely due to an apocalyptic mood of the Age of Discovery, where authors like Jeronimo de Mendieta took the stories about floods, the deluge, uh, the promised savior Quetzalcoatl also makes an appearance and somehow he's tied to being of Hebrew origin and therefore Quetzalcoatl <laughs> was kind of like the second coming of the Messiah of the Bible and if you sort of extrapolate further into time and, 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 and you go, you fast forward to people like the Mormon church when they get established in the early 19th century that's one of their, the tenets of, of their religion, this idea that Jesus walked among the native people before the arrival of Europeans and pro, he had proselytized to them because somehow they, you know, the, the, that story from the Mormon church ties it into the notion of the lost tribes of Israel. And, you know, a lot of people, they when they hear the connection that, that's often made by people who don't really know the history and and like to uh, read sensationalist uh, uh, versions of history. You know, they, they hear lost tribes of Israel, they hear Native Americans, and usually the Mormon church is the one that's given credit, at least here in the United States, for having been the one that that, that starts that, that, that idea. But it really goes back all the way to people like Jeronimo de Mendieta and what's the other guy with the last name of the G? Gomara? Gomara, yeah. yeah. So those two, those two guys from the early, the early years of the colonial period in, in, the, in the 16th century, are the ones that make these connections between native people and the lost tribes of Israel. And it's largely based not on evidence, not on science, but it's all on religious thinking and millenarianism. Well, yeah, because you know you, you come here and there's all these people that you had no idea existed, and you're like, well shouldn't these people are not mentioned in the bible like how could these people be real if the bible doesn't talk about them yeah and so then they're like right. well the bible does talk about these lost <laughs> you know there's <laughs> yeah. this lost group so these must be them right they must represent this lost group of people because you know there's no way the bible could be wrong and people exist in this world that you know we didn't know about so they i I think it, it has its roots in that where they're like using the Bible as like a literal history book. And if it's really the word of God, then God doesn't make mistakes. Right. So mm -hmm. how do we explain yeah. the existence of these people, you know, and 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 justify, you know, what we're about to do to them? You know, we, we had no idea that these people existed. I'm reminded of that old song by Aslan Underground. How'd it go? I'm a lost soul. I'm a lost soul. Remember that song? Uh, yeah. A -U -G. Yeah. That's a good These one. are the last. I mean, so it makes sense. AEG, are, yeah, it makes sense what you were saying back then. And I, I found uh, this article in the. Uh, it's called English Interest in the Lost Tribes. It's from the Jewish Quarterly Review, and it makes a, an interesting point about the Spanish historians, all these cronistas, that they fell within these two different schools of thought. One school of thought. Um, and I'll, I'll just read uh, the quote here. It says, one hailed the new subjects of Spain as the progeny of Israel. The other, while admitting the existence of certain Hebrew practices and customs among the natives, suggested Satan as their source. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and then it goes on to, to give a quote um, 
where one of these cronistas says, Satan had counterfeited in this people whom he had chosen for himself the history, manners, customs, traditions, and expectations of the Hebrews in order that their minds might thus be rendered inaccessible to the faith which he foresaw the church would in due time introduce amongst them. So that's a that's an interesting uh, <laughs> perspective. <laughs> so is he saying that Satan basically prepped um, native people to be receptive to missionaries, friars came over and started to proselytize the, the good word to them? Is that what he's saying? I'm, I'm not sure. Right. Well, he's he's saying that he prepped that Satan prepped the indigenous people to be inaccessible. Oh, to be to inaccessible. So, uh huh. Yeah. So he imbued them with characteristics of the Hebrews, so that they could resist uh, the true church. Uh, I guess. Okay. Got it. Got it. So they're in. <laughs> The lost tribes of Israel, the Jews, and all of Native Americans are basically Satan's uh, tools. Well, uh, yeah, that's weird. Well, what's interesting is that, you know, indigenous, in all of these histories and, and stories, um, indigenous people have no agency of their own, right? You know, they, they're just actors. They're just characters in this broader play that's going on for the benefit of the Spaniards. Speaking of plays, so you also brought up the Tlaxcalteca and how they were gathered uh, at the mm -hmm. plaza in, in Tlaxcala and how they performed sort of a mock battle in celebration of Corpus Christi. I mean, that was kind of mm -hmm. like a, one of those, those um, church plays that they used to do back in... Th those things originate in Spain, right? Yeah, and so yeah. when when the Spanish come and they begin to proselytize and and impose their religion on the indigenous people, one of the things that they do in order to spread the gospel is they use these p type of plays, and and it's always uh, done in in a way that it, it it pits one group against the other. There's always this battle between good and evil. The Spanish are the good guys. The Moors are the bad guys. The Spanish are the good guys. The Indians are the bad guys. And so this battle that, that the Tlaxcala... And, and, and oftentimes, the, the, the friars and the missionaries would uh, instruct the indigenous people that they were missionizing to uh, in, in the play and what roles that they were going to play. And so some of the things that I was... Going back to my article that I just wrote on, on Danza, some of the things that I, that I don't really include too much in the article because it would have made it longer, but... Some of the some of the the traditions that that arose out of out of these missionary plays end up becoming a lot of the danzas de conquistas mm -hmm. that are scattered throughout Mexico, like Danza de los Apaches, like Los Matachinas, for example, is another danza de, de yeah, conquista. Yeah, they're like these religious dramas, exactly that were adapted, adapted to serve this purpose right. of missionizing people, and they go all the way back. And this is fifteen thirty nine, so we're talking. How many years uh, from removed from from the fall of Tenochtitlan? We're, we're looking at what eight, 18 years or so? Fifteen twenty one, fifteen thirty nine. So twenty years in, right to to the conquista, we we already have these these drama, this religious drama play that's being imposed and used to not only proselytize but also to. To set the stage in terms of who the hierarchy of, of the, the new colonial government, who's in charge mm -hmm. and who's not in charge. And then you begin to see that hierarchy begin to take shape, which later on, once you have more mestizaje taking place, more intermarriage between, you know, native people, Spanish, and then also uh, with, with uh, en enslaved Africans that are brought into Mexico, then you begin to see that casta system that begins to develop with the different names for all the different variations of mixtures, yeah, levels of mixture. And but it all sort of, you know, it, it it all stems from from these these plays and this idea of putting people in their place and and not only instructing them in the uh, in the faith, but also instructing them on on the the caste that they're going to follow in this new colonial system that's being set up. It's a really good point. 
One of the uh, the things that we're going to get to in part two of this podcast is the imagery of La Virgen and how she ties into the apocalypticism that was brought by the Spaniards because really her image is based entirely on uh, the virgin of the apocalypse from the book of Revelation. And when you start to look more into the virgin of the apocalypse, you start to see exactly where this imagery of La Virgen de Guadalupe, like the origins of its imagery, is very tied into the book of Revelation and the apocalypse. So, But not only that, I mean, I'm not sure if this is also in, in the second part, but I think it is. But she's also tied to Criollo nationalism. She's mm-hmm. also tied Absolutely. to the emergence of this distinct identity that uh, people who are technically Spanish and we can also get into, I mean, we did an episode on this right, season one about what it means to be considered Spanish in, in New Spain. You didn't have to be technically uh, 100% uh, you know, Espanol from, from Spain, but that was also sort of like a class in itself, like saying American today, right? Like you you're born in the United States and you have certain customs and traditions and you're an American regardless of your ancestry. And so, you know, to call yourself Spanish also took on that connotation. And Criollos were seen by Peninsulares as being, even if they were 100% quote unquote Spanish or not, they were all seen as being these mongrels mixed with indigenous people that had been tainted by the land itself. A lot of these pseudoscientists that emerged in that period were making these weird arguments that anything that came from the Americas, just by definition that it came from the Americas, was inferior to anything that was European. Plants, Mm -hmm. animals, including people themselves, regardless of whether or not they they could verify and prove that they were 100% quote-unquote of European ancestry by the sheer fact that they had been born in the Americas, that, by definition, defined them as being inferior. And so the Peninsulares would take that idea and they would perceive themselves to be superior to the Criollos, which were basically the same people, right? In effect, the Peninsulares were Spanish people born in Spain, the Criollos supposedly Spanish people born in, in, in the Americas. And so when, when the Criollos begin to adopt a Mexican or Neo-Mexica identity for themselves they use the virgen and the miracle of the apparition as part of who they are as a people as a new identity separate from that of spain yeah they yeah they flip the script they they look at it well if this is the new jerusalem and if this is the new world in the way that you you had mentioned then we must be the chosen mm-hmm. people exactly because We're the ones who were here where she appeared. And that's something we'll get into in part two of this podcast. I don't want to get too into it right now. So if you are listening, dear listeners, please stay tuned and uh, check out part two of this podcast. Because we're going to get into more of the Virgin of the Apocalypse. Dimoitase. Yo. Thank you for listening to Tales from Atlantis, a project of the Chimali Institute of Mesoamerican Arts. If you enjoy the show, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. You can do this by visiting talesfromastlantis.com and clicking support the podcast. Your continued support will help keep the podcast ad-free and independent. Until next time, timoitase.